Well, good morning. We're nearing the end of a series on boundaries. This series is based upon what we learned from the order of creation when God created man. I'm going to begin with a quick review. Number one, we were created by God, for God, and our lives are to be about God. God created Adam first so that Adam would know that he primarily belonged to God, and that he was first and foremost God's person. He came from God, was made by God, was made for God, and was to live for God. Number two, second of all, we're to get our identity, our value, our purpose, and our fulfillment or happiness from him. We get those things from him. Adam was to get that from him, not from the woman who he would receive later, not from children he would have later. He was to get those things from God. Number three, being married is something I do. It is not who I am. Next, Eve is created. Eve is primarily God's person, as was Adam. Eve is primarily made for God and to live for God, not for Adam. And so these two people now are together, but they are second to God in each other's lives. And then number four, being a parent is something I may do. It is not who I am. So later on in God's order, they had children. But those children are not primarily theirs. They're primarily God's. They are stewards of those children, and they're to raise those children by God's standards. Those children are not to be first in their lives, in Adam and Eve's lives. They're not even supposed to be second. They're to be third. God is first, their mates are second, and they are third. As you know, God intends for us to spend a lifetime with our, our spouses, and that's what happens when we get that right. And then we're only to have our kids temporarily. We're to raise them, set them free to go live their own lives. Now, today's message is about balance boundaries and singles. And I want to give you these ways that boundaries apply to single people. This will apply to people who want to date and marry. It'll apply to people who don't do that, who, who never may, may not wish to marry. So let's begin in your outline there, observations for singles. Number one, first of all, you're to find your life in the Lord. We can't get life from each other. The Bible says that God has life in himself. The Bible says in John chapter 6, Jesus said that you do not have life in yourself. We don't have this life, this intangible that we had, that we need, that if we had that, everything would be right, everything would be okay. But the good news is Jesus came and died to give us life, in fact, give it to us abundantly. So again, the Bible says we don't have what only he can give. The problem is when we don't get our life from him, we seek to get it from other people, maybe places, or maybe thing. But no, nothing else but him and living in the center of his will will ever be enough for us long term. Your identity is not someone's date or mate. You are God's person. You don't get your value from who wants to date you or marry you or be your friend. You get your value from the fact that God wanted you to be, God made you, God loves you, Christ died for you. And then you're to get your purpose from God. Your purpose should be to fulfill his plan for your life, not to have a certain group of friends or reach a certain economic level or marry a certain person or date a certain person. And then your fulfillment ought to come from the joy of being who you're supposed to be, not from what some other person does for you or gives to you. Now in your outline, I put two verses. One's Colossians 3, 4, and there it says, Christ who is our life. He's the only one that can give it to us. If we don't get it from him, we expect it from others who can't give it to us. And over time, that frustration grows that they're not giving it to us. They're not supposed to give it to us and they can't give it to us. Christ is our life. And then Colossians 2.10 says, in him you have been made complete. So the only way we can be complete is in him. Because of sin, all of us have this, this void inside of us, this emptiness. And it's a God-sized emptiness that only God can fill. And nobody else can fill it. But if we don't get it filled with the Lord, we expect other people to fill it. They get frustrated because they can't. We get frustrated because they don't. No other person, place, or thing can fill that empty void that only God can fill. So fail to find your life in the Lord, and what you end up doing is using people to try to fill up that empty spot that's missing in your life. So the first question I ask this morning is, are you finding your life in the Lord? And then we go to number two. 
Number two, make your life about God and his purpose for it. Make your life about God's purpose for it. Number one, know who you were made to know. That's Jesus. Eternal life is not primarily about having your sins forgiven, even though they are. It's not primarily about going to heaven when you die, even though you do. It's not primarily about missing hell when you die, even though you do. Eternal life is primarily about having a personal relationship with the God that you were made for. Look at John 17, 3 there in your outline. This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. It's a relationship. Eternal life doesn't happen when I die and go to heaven. Eternal hap life happens, starts when I come to Christ. It's a relationship I have with God. Number two, be who he made you to be like Christ. Romans 8, 29 says that God's trying to conform us to the image of his son. God's goal in our lives is to make us like his son. We're to have our own uniqueness, but we're to have his character. The verse in front of that is Romans 8, 28 that says, for we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, those called according to his purpose. That verse, what it's saying is that everything that happens to us, good and bad, it doesn't say God does those things, but it says God uses those things to conform us to the image of his son. See, too often our goal is to be happy and God wants us to be holy. If your goal is to be happy, you're gonna be unhappy a lot because happiness requires good circumstances. But if you'll learn to be holy, you can be happy because if you'll be holy, you can have God's joy. If you try to be happy, you'll eventually be unholy. You'll do something wrong to escape uh, or numb the pain that you feel inside of this emptiness. But if your goal is to be holy, you'll eventually be happy because you'll have God's joy no matter what the circumstance. Paul is in, on death row in a prison in Rome and he writes the book of Philippians. The book of Philippians is a book about how to have joy. Isn't that interesting that free people aren't writing that book? But the guy who's writing it, the guy who has it's on death row. And he's telling people who are free how to have joy. Be who he made you to be. And then number three, do what he made you to do, his will. Ephesians 2.10, you're created in Christ Jesus for good works. You weren't just created to be someone, you're created to do something. The early part of this verse says that God decided before you were even born what he wanted you to do. Now notice this verse in your outline, a very familiar verse, Matthew 6.33. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The entire foundation of this verse is about seeking God first, knowing the God you're made to know. And he says, seek first his kingdom. That's doing what God made you to do. And then seek his righteousness. That's being who he made you to be. If I'll be who I ought to be and do what I ought to do and know who I ought to know, then it says that God will add all the things to my life that I need. So that's what I need to do. I need to give my life to that. I'll have this life that God wants me to have and that Christ died to give me if I'll put him first, knowing him, being like him, doing what he made me to do. Getting my identity, value, and purpose and fulfillment in him, my life isn't dependent on my circumstances. I can be okay at a funeral of somebody I love. I can be okay when my, I lost my job. I can be okay in any circumstance because I have something in me that regulates me. I'm not just bounced around by externals in my life. I'm not emotionally driven, I'm spiritually driven. Having life enables you to be okay when life isn't okay and life isn't okay a lot. Now all of us wanna know that our lives matter. If you're loving God, you're serving others. If you're not serving others, you're not really loving God. If you're serving others, then your life matters. The people who mean something to you are the people who do something for you. The people who mean the most to you do something for you the most. So the more you serve God and others, the more your life is gonna matter. If you do nothing and you become nothing, then your life doesn't really matter much. But if you'll do something, become someone, your life can matter a lot. So being who he made you to be, doing what you're made to do, will give you the personal fulfillment that God wants you to have. So see, all that is, is, is uh, separate from whether or not you're married or single. What I've just told you has nothing to do with whether or not you have kids or a or hundred kids. 
It doesn't have anything to do with what kind of job you have or how, how, uh, how educated you are. It's something every person can have. And that's what God wants you to have. Is your life about God's purpose or about lesser things? Now, let's talk to those of you who are single who probably would like to be married. Number three, seek a community, not a companion. Seek a community, not a companion. God is a relational God. He dwells in relationship, Father, Son, and Spirit. Relationship is not just something God does, it's the very fabric of who God is. And he made us for, for relationships. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 36 to 40, we're given the greatest commandments by Jesus. They said, what are the greatest commandments? Here they are. Number one's about relationship, love God first, most, and best. Number two's about relationship and love your neighbor as yourself. So we're to have a relationship with him and we're to have a relationship with others. We're to be in community, family. That's part of what a church does for you. Some of you have come from really messed up families. You can't have in a family what God wanted you to have in a family. But you can have it in a church if you'll get involved and be a part of people's lives. Look at Genesis 2.18. It says, it's not good for the man to be alone. Now this verse doesn't mean that every person should or will be married. It does mean that nobody ought to be doing life isolated by him or herself. Now, when I say companion here, I'm talking about a date or a mate. So that's, um, I'm using that in that sense. If you go seeking a companion, here's the good news. You'll probably find one. Now, here's the bad news. You might end up with the wrong one. Half of people who marry apparently do. Now, we'll let that settle in a bit. If you want a relationship, you can find one, but it'll probably a good chance of it being the wrong one. Half of people who marry think that the right relationship is now the wrong relationship. That the right one is now obviously not the right one. That ought to scare all of us. Half the people who are convinced they found the right one later are convinced they married the wrong one. So don't go out looking for a companion. Instead, become a part of a community. If God has a plan to put you with someone, he's big enough to work it out without you manipulating it. Now listen closely to what I'm about to say. God has a plan for your life, and it's a good one. You get off that plan, you can wreck your life. But if you'll stay in God's plan, it's a good one. If God has a plan for you to be with a person, he'll work it out. He doesn't need you going on to, I gotta get a date.com. Or whatever else to find you somebody. God can work it out. He's big enough to do that. God brought Tracy uh, Rogers from Titusville, Florida to Carson Newman College. Why did he do that? Because she was going to meet a guy named Grant. Actually, Grant Warner on a dating show at the school. They married her. <laughs> True story. Now his daughter's at that school, and God brought a guy named Jack Tyler from North Carolina to play golf at Carson Newman. Why? Because he had a plan for Jack and Shelby's life. My Emily married a guy from uh, South Mississippi, but God brought him up here to work a couple of summers, so he'd be at Walgreens where uh, Emily worked one summer, and they met each other, and uh, he, God worked it out. And so now they're married, giving me two wonderful grandkids, I got to tell you this, when Matt came over the first time, I didn't know him, so I was cleaning a pistol on the table as he came in. <laughs> He's familiar with pistols. It didn't bother him at all, but anyway. <laughs> God brought Betsy Brown from Lebanon, Tennessee to UT and then to Calvary Baptist Church so she had run into me. And so we got married. This, if, God's, if it's God's will for you, he'll arrange it. Do you think you want God's will more than he wants it for you? But see, if you go out manipulating what you want to happen, the good news is you can get a guy, you can get a girl. The bad news is the chances are highly likely that you're going to get the wrong guy and the wrong girl. The more involved you are in a community of friends, the less you'll have the emotional need for, for a companion. If you remember, King David uh, ended up uh, wrecking his life. The rest of his life was a mess, even though he was forgiven, uh, with a one-night stand with a lady named Bathsheba. You know why that happened? Because David was alone and isolated and empty. 
His companionship had primarily come from his best friend, Jonathan, who had died in a battle. And in his loneliness, led to weakness, led to adultery, led to murder, led to a mess. So seek a, com seek a community, not a companion. Number four, recognize loneliness is a part of the human condition, not just a result of being single. You say, well, I'm single and I'm lonely. Guess what? There's all kinds of married people who are lonely. And it's worse being married or lonely when you're married than it is when you're being single because when you're single, you might be able to reason why you are, but when you're married, you think you're not supposed to be, but the truth is you still are. You may be four inches away in a bed, but you feel like you're all alone. Now, everybody who has any experience knows exactly what I'm talking about. If you're young, you're just gonna have to take my word for it. We all feel lonely and alone at times. Do, do you feel lonely sometimes? Welcome to the human race. Feeling alone at times is normal. How do you cure it? You cure it by getting involved in other people's lives. Being alone, living disconnected from others is a choice. It's a bad one. Why? Because it's not good for man to be alone. So recognize there's gonna be times when you're lonely even if you're in a good marriage. It, it just happens. Our emotions can just go up and down and small things can happen or big things can happen. They're not permanent, but they're real. Now, number five, remember that it's better to be single in God's will than to be married outside of God's will. <clears throat> it's better to be single in God's will than married outside of God's will. You've heard the expression, grass seems to grow uh, greener on the other side of the fence. See, single people fantasize about how great it would be, married, be to be married. A lot of married people fantasize about how great it would be to be single. Now, that's the truth. Both have advantages, both have disadvantages. It's not best to be married or to be single. It's best to be in God's will. Now, we're not going to look at it, but 1 Corinthians 7, 32 to 35, Paul says that being single is actually to be preferred over being married. If you're single, you can do whatever you think the Lord wants you to do. But once you're married, you've always got to consider your mate and your kids. If you've got a little baby, you just can't do everything, can you? You go through seasons in life that determine how available you are. All those things happen in a marriage. It's not best to be single or married. It's best to be in the Lord's will. If it's God's will for you to be single, you don't want to be married. You don't want to be married. Number six. Beware of being in love with being in love. This is huge. Beware of being in love with being in love. If you go looking for love, you'll find something that looks like love, but it might not turn out to be love at all. With a 50% divorce rate and 70% when people remarry with children, what looks like love doesn't always turn out to be love or doesn't turn out to be enough. Most gr people, girls especially, go into dating relationships hoping to be, uh, with hopes of being married. They do everything they can to fall in love with this guy. And they do everything they can to get this girl or this guy to fall in love with them. And so that's, that, that's the game that gets played. Instead, she should be guarding her heart, remaining morally pure, and trying her best not to fall in love. If you'll guard your heart, stay morally pure, try your best not to fall in love, you'll find yourself crazy in love with somebody. But it's not because of what you've done in each other's arms, it's because of what God has done in your hearts. And that's a whole different story, isn't it? A lot of people are in love with being in love. Some people are just in heat. You can go ahead and laugh if you want to. That is funny. But it's also true. A girl will give a guy sex and she thinks, a, guy, a girl will give a guy sex to get what she thinks is love. A guy will give a girl what she thinks is love to get sex. Now, I'm not going to say that again, but everybody with any age and experience in this room understands what I just said. If you're young, you need to take my word for it. If someone really loves you, he'll wait. <clears throat> Buy you a ring. Lay down the rest of his life for you. The guy who dumps you because you don't give him sex is the very guy you don't want to marry. 
Believe me, you don't want to marry that guy. If he says, if you love me, you'll let me. I bet nobody's heard that in this room. Then you say him to him, if you love me, you'll wait. You'll wait. The girl who won't put out is the kind of girl you want to marry. See, guys don't like to drive used cars, but a lot of them like to be in the antiquing business. You'll figure that out later. And I'm scaring you, aren't I? Everything I just said is so absurdly true. Don't, don't let it, don't miss it. Beware of being in love uh, with being in love. Number seven, stay away from fixer-uppers. Talked about this a little bit last week. Dating and marriages are bad places for therapy. We talked last week about people being who they are and the fact that you can't make them be somebody they are not. If you date and marry a mess, your marriage is going to be a mess. If you marry a damsel in distress, you're going to have a distressed damsel. Stay away from fixer-uppers. Number eight, use dating to discover a person. Never try to change the person you're dating. Dating is a time of discovery, not pursuit, discovery. The whole purpose of dating is to get to know someone to discover who that person is. Is this the kind of person I would be interested in spending my life with? Is this the kind of person I think would be a good husband or wife? Is this the kind of person I think would be a good father or mother? Is this the kind of person I think would be a good grandfather or a good grandmother? Who is this person? And so your whole goal is to get, to get to know that person. Now, last week I talked about how we have blind spots and how we fail to see red flags in people that we're emotionally connected to the outcome. If I want this relationship to be a good one, I'll ignore all the red flags, get there. I'll live in denial. I'll create my own reality and then I'll, I'll, I'll believe my own lies and I'll convince myself that this person is who I hope them to be, not who they really are. And I'm telling you, it's always a train wreck in the end. You, when you go to date somebody, you don't need to hope they're anybody. You need to find out who they are. And by the way, you don't, get, you don't find that out making out. You find that out talking, being around them, doing things together. One of the most important reasons for deciding who you'll marry is that you can live with what you least like about that person. See, you, well, most people marry because of what they love most about them. But a lot of people got deal breakers in their trunk. And eventually you have to face the deal breakers. You married them because they're so funny or so good looking or so this or so that. But then you have to go home and live with their dysfunction and you find out that it's smothering and suffocating and unbearable. And you can't live that way the rest of your life. If you date to know, then you remain morally pure. If you do that, you're not emotionally committed to the outcome. Your commitment is to finding out who this person really is. And if you'll date that way, you'll be able to see the red flags and you'll be able to spot and, and uh, take the exit ramp. Okay, I just found out something about him, not the kind of person I want. I got two options. Be smart and get out of this relationship. Or number two, I'll stay in the relationship and my love will change him. Let me hear an audible gasp from all you people with any experience. No, your love won't change you. The red flags will become danger signs. And you need to be yourself. Don't try to be who you think they would like. See, here's what happens in marriage. I want this to work, so I'm going to figure out who I think you'd like, and that's who I'm going to be. I'm going to hide who I really am. I don't think you'd want that person. And then the other person doing the same thing. So you got two people getting married who don't even know each other. And how many times does somebody get married, four or five months later, they say, I don't even know this person. Well, of course you don't. They were hiding from you the whole time, and you were hiding from them. You want to know, what's he do when he gets angry? What does she do when she doesn't get her way? You say, well, I don't know. Well, don't marry him until you find out. That's going to be a big deal someday. Be yourself. If they don't like you the way you are, you don't want to be married to them. Doesn't that make sense? But too often it's two people pretending to be what the other wants. 
All you married people can confirm this. After the wedding, any pretending stops. Well, he didn't go to church, but he started going because I was going. He probably's not going to keep going. Well, he drank some, but he quit drinking because uh, I told him I wasn't going to marry a guy who drank. Guess what? He's going to be drinking again. And the list could go on and on and on. Gold, doesn't, gold does change people. It takes the masks back off. So beware of, of, of having a fantasy about who a person is. Now here's number nine. Never compromise moral standards in dating. Never compromise moral standards in dating. God's plan for relationships is moral purity. Let's say you don't believe in God or the Bible. The best plan for relationships is moral purity. When daters stay pure, hearts don't get broken. If you don't mess around and mess up, there is no breakup. There's just an end to the relationship. We figured out this isn't the one. There's no heartbreak. You weren't that emotionally dug in. But when you get physical, you emotionally dig in, and it is a breakup, and at least one of the people, sometimes both, get broken. And then they go into the next relationship broken. Not well, broken. Especially in cases of divorce, which I'll talk about here in a moment. When you do it right, when you stay pure, hearts don't get broken, souls don't get damaged, mistrust doesn't get sown, emotions get purified, and real love gets recognized. I love this guy. We've never even kissed. I love him, and I want to be with him the rest of my life. That's a good sign. But if you've been with each other a lot in ways you shouldn't be, I guarantee you your emotions are red hot but they may have nothing to do with genuine love. Now look in your outline at 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, 3 to 8. This is the will of God. Stop. You know, people always want to know, what's God's will of my life? I'm about to tell you. This is plain as day. If there's nothing else you can figure out what God's will for your life is, this is one you can. What's he going to say? This is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, he's going to explain it that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel, his body, in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, and that no man transgress or defraud his brother in the matter, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we told you before and solemnly warned you. Now, what's it mean to transgress or defraud? It's to create a desire it's to, to in someone that if they fulfill that desire, they will have sinned. It's to be sexy and seductive to get his attention. And it's what a guy might do to, to lower the standards of a girl to take advantage of her. It's defrauding. Notice it says God is the avenger. God doesn't like this. Now, verse 7, for God's not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. So, watch this. He who rejects this is not rejecting Rocky. He's not rejecting court and church. He's rejecting uh, God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now, how, how, how could that be any clearer? How could God's will for your life be any clearer? Now, let me tell you something about God. God's primary goal in life is your unhappiness, Okay? Now, I'm being facetious. His primary goal in your life is your joy. He's going to, one day when you die, if you're a believer, you're going to go to heaven. You'll never know sickness, sorrow, pain, suffering, death, tears. All you'll know is an eternity of joy and happiness. That's what God wants to give you. Now, what the Bible does is tell us how to get as much of that as we can get here. And see, what some of you think is, if I'll be sexually involved, I will be happy. And what happens is you might be at the moment, but eventually it's going to come back and bite you, and you're going to lose. Now, many of you know that I wrote my doctoral thesis on Christian dating. After being a mess as a teenager, I learned to get it right. So here's what I decided. Christian girls are my sisters in Christ. So I'm not going to date anybody that's not a Christian. She's my sister in Christ. Now, I had a sister, and I never kissed her on the mouth. And so I shouldn't be kissing this sister on the mouth. 
I'm dating this girl. I don't know if she's the one I'm supposed to marry. She might be the one one of my friends is supposed to marry. And so I don't want to be taking from her what is supposed to be his. And she should not be wanting to give to me what is supposed, she's supposed to one day give to him. This makes sense? So if I'm going to treat her as a sister, I'm just, it's going to be, we're just really, really, really good friends. I dated like this for years. There were a few times in the heat of, the heat of passion, I held hands. There were many times, many, many times, girls I dated for periods of time, and I finally just said, you know, this isn't the one. This is a wonderful person. She makes somebody a great wife, but it's not the one for me. And so I decided I wouldn't kiss a girl on the lips till I was engaged. If you get the train started, you probably aren't going to stop the train. You get yourself on a slippery slope. Well, we'll just do this, and this leads to this, and this leads to that, and that leads to that. It's called the law of diminishing returns. First time you held hands, I, whoa, wow, man, I'm sweating. That's the greatest thing ever. And then that wasn't enough. I need to put my arm around her. Oh, man, this is heaven. That's not enough. I need to kiss her on the lip, on the, on the jowl, you know, on the cheek. Uh, so I will kiss her on the che- uh, cheek. Oh, that was nice, but I really want to kiss her on the lips. Well, now I want to kiss her for a really long time. You see how it goes? It's the law of diminishing returns. And so you get yourself all emotionally entangled. And then one day, yep, you break up. And the girl learns that when somebody says, I love you, he's using you. And now she marries the guy God had for him. Does he really love her? How can she know? He says he does. They all said they do. And they just used her. Is he using me too? I don't think you've ever been this quiet. I must be right. So I didn't kiss a girl till I was engaged. It explains why I was engaged to Bessie after nine days. True story. <clears throat> nine months later, we were married. No, Sarah did not come along at the wedding. She came along four years later. Now, Bessie and I are professionals. Don't try this at home. You'll get hurt. We don't encourage anybody to do this in nine days. We did. Almost 41 years later, we got lucky or got it right, one or the other. God's best is best for you. Moral purity keeps your libido and emotions in check. It forces you to talk. What are you going to do? You got to talk. You got to do things together. Get to know each other. It protects you from broken hearts when the relationship ends. Now listen closely. If you don't hear anything I say, listen closely. Moral purity is God's standard for his people. It's the same for a 60-year-old divorcee or widow as it is for a 13-year-old virgin. It doesn't change. And all kinds of churches are full of all kinds of single programs, which are, you know, people come and have Bible study and go have sex. If that shocks you, you just don't know what's going on. I remember a girl at our church years ago showed me a letter. This guy wrote the letter saying, since we're not virgins, it doesn't matter that we stay morally pure anymore. He's just using her. All he, all he cared about was, was trying to use her. All he cared about was using her. This is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Now, here's what the verses are, say that I've listed. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, if faith is believing that God will reward you if you do what he says. Do you believe that? If you do, then you're saying, then if I stay morally pure, that'll be to my advantage, not my detriment. I won't be losing by not being sexually active. I will be winning by not being that way. Romans eight twenty six says that we don't know how to pray as we should. Why is that true? Because we don't know what's best for us. We don't know what's best for us. We think we do. But we don't. We ask for things that would hurt us. We plow into relationships that do hurt us. Think about it. Wouldn't everybody agree that anyone who gets married thinks he's marrying the right person? Everybody who gets married thinks, I am marrying the right person. But 50% of them eventually come to the conclusion, I definitely married the wrong person. How's that happen? Well, it does. 
And I'm not saying this to hurt anybody here who's been through a divorce. You really got to have this conversation with your kids. Or they'll just, they'll just reproduce the pattern. You got to really say, I miss God's will. And if you screwed the marriage up, you got to own it. You got to own it. But you got to have that conversation. So what happens is 50% of the time, people later decide this was a terrible idea. We want what we want. We get what we wanted. And then we realize we didn't want what we thought we wanted at all. Happens a lot. So how do you avoid that? You do it right on the front end. You say, well, if I stay morally pure, does that mean I'll never uh, end up in a bad marriage and get divorced? No, it doesn't. But boy, your chances skyrocket. They skyrocket. Proverbs 14, 12, and 16, 25 both say, there's a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. So just in case we didn't get it the first time, God puts it in there a second time. See, not only do we not know what we ought to want, sometimes what we want can kill us. It can destroy us. In Acts 3, 26, it says, God sent his son Jesus to bless us. How? By turning us from our wrong ways. You will be blessed if you quit doing the wrong thing. If you go through the loss of a spouse, listen closely, either by death or by divorce, I want to give you some great advice. If you're a young person here today and you're single and you've never married, I want to give you some great advice. Here it is. I need you, you ought to make a contract with God, a written contract. This is who I am committed to being. This is what I will and will not do with someone of the opposite sex. It's a contract and you sign it. Because especially if you've had experience, the temptation goes up exponentially. Exponentially. And so you ought to make a contract with God. This is who I am going to be. See, let's go back to the whole boundary thing. I am primarily God's. My life is not primarily about getting a woman. Or a man. My, my life is primarily about honoring this God I was made for. And in the story of that, I may find someone to spend my life with and have kids. But they're not the story of my life. My relationship with God is the story of my life. So make a contract. Acknowledging that contract that your life is going to be about him not hooking up with someone. Write out physical and emotional and moral boundaries that, that will ensure your purity. God's morality never changes. It's the same for someone who's been married 10 times as if for someone who's 10 years old. Now, three quick more, three more quick points and we're done. Number 10, don't talk to non-professionals of the opposite sex about your problems. Don't talk to non-professionals of the opposite sex about your problems. Wrong discussions with opposite sex about painful problems, especially marriage problems, create illegitimate emotions. In other words, if you're talking to the wrong people about stuff you shouldn't be talking about, you're going to start feeling things. And most feelings are going to feel like love, and they're probably not. There were two girls I dated that I could have felt in love with. One, I remember going to pick her up on a date and she had been beaten up by her dad that day. And she limped to the car. I know of another friend of mine who dated a girl that her stepdad was called the beast. And he rescued her. He was a pastor. At the wedding, I was in the wedding. I told him not to marry her. He did. Lasted about five years. And it was over. There was another girl I dated. Her dad disappeared. Not divorced, disappeared. So there's no alimony, no nothing like that. She grew up in poverty. She's a cute girl, and I, I felt sorry for her. And I could very easily thought, well, you know, I think I love this girl. But it wasn't love, it was compassion. You got to know the difference. Guys need to talk to guys. Gals need to talk to gals. See a professional of the opposite sex. But see, here's two divorced people. They both got hurt. So what do they do? They get together. Oh, well, tell me about your divorce. Oh, it was so terrible. Oh, oh. And then, oh, what about yours? Oh, it was so painful. Oh, oh, oh. And next thing you know, you got all this emotion in that relationship that never should have been there. Which brings us to number 11. Build your new relationships around who you're becoming, not around past pain. Around who you're becoming, who you want to be, who's in that contract. 
the person in the contract. It happens often. Two divorced people looking for the next Mr. or Mrs. Wright almost immediately talk about their painful and terrible divorces with their exes. Rather than working to become their best selves and bonding, if they bond around those best selves, they instead bond around their shared pain. Oh, poor you. I understand. That's terrible. I can't believe he or she treated you that way. And the pity leads to emotion, and the emotion feels like love, even if it's not. If you need to date... You don't need to date. Work on becoming who God wants you to be enough in yourself. The person who needs a date and a mate has, has an empty soul and they're looking for somebody to fill it. They're looking for love and life in all the wrong places. And that person won't fill it and before long they'll be disappointed because they thought that person would fill it. I don't know if you knew this. Five years after a divorce, I think it's 50% of people wish they had never divorced. Now, here's why I think that is. A lot of people get out of divorces for, for not good reasons. There are some reasons you ought to get out. But, but they get out because things were hard and difficult. And so they find this, so they know this person and all their weaknesses. So now they find this person they don't know at all and they put the show on and everybody puts the show on. Everybody tries to fall in love. Sure enough, it happens. They get married about three or four years in. You know what they realize? This ain't much different from that. What they found out is marriage is marriage. It's not always perfect. It's not always great. Sometimes it's really, really hard. And you gotta die to yourself you got to quit making it all about you. Sometimes you got to stand up for yourself. You're ready to date when you don't need to. It just happened this way with Betsy. I won't get into the whole story. It's quite a story. But anyway, there was no time in my young life when I was not, I was not looking for somebody to date toward marriage. I mean, I was completely out of the game. And God brought Betsy in. If you need to date, it means you're empty looking for somebody to fill you up. They can't, don't put them under that pressure. A healthy relationship requires two healthy people. Two unhealthy people can't have a healthy relationship. And so they're lonely, and so they marry, and now they're lonelier than they were when they were married. In the Bible, the two become one. One half plus one half just equals one half. God's plan for marriage is two healthy whole givers, not two unhealthy, empty, needers, takers, receivers. Now, number 12, last one. This is for those of you who have been through a divorce. Number 12, don't allow divorce to define you. Don't allow divorce to define you. When I came here to this church 36 plus years ago, one of the best men in the church had gone through a divorce, been horribly betrayed by his wife. One of the first things he told me, well, I guess you know I've got the big D on my chest. At that point, he was defining himself by his divorce. Don't do that. You should be defined by knowing the God you're made to know, becoming the person you're made to do, and doing the things you were made to, or made to be and doing the things you were made to do. God hates divorce. He doesn't hate divorced people. Anybody who's divorced knows why God hates it. It hurts people God loves. It makes lives way more complicated. Way more complicated. God isn't against divorced people. He loves divorced people. Christ died for divorced people. Divorce happens. Sometimes it should. So if you've been, are or have been divorced, God still has a plan for your life. He still can use you. He still will use you. He still wants to use you. Divorce is a part of your story now, but it doesn't have to be the main theme. Your story is to be about God and what he wants to do in you and through you. In Ephesians 2.10, the New American Standard says that we are his workmanship. It's the verse that says created for good works. The Greek word for workmanship is the, is the Greek word poema, from which we get our word poem. 
It's a story. It's what's God saying. God is writing a story in your life. And the story's not over. You can't come to a divorce and then say, okay, that's the end of the story. Nothing else matters after that. Absolutely not. You, that's a part of your story. All of our stories contain dark, difficult times. They all include disappointments and failures. All of them. Your story isn't over. Divorce is not a time to give up on your story. It's a time to get the pen and hand it back to God and let him keep writing. The best part of your life is likely ahead of you, not behind you. God wants to use you. You're not, he's not through with you. He's not throwing you away. He loves you. He cares more than anybody about how that hurts you. He cares more than anybody about how complicated your life is now because of that. Give him the pen back. The enemy will make you feel like your story doesn't matter now. It does. The enemy will try to make you feel that your spiritual usefulness was lost when your marriage failed. It wasn't. The enemy will try to make you feel that God loves you less now. He doesn't. So give him the pen because the best part of your story may be the next chapter.